Be perfect. These three words from the King James can scare the most pious of Christians. Be ye perfect. Not just good, not just avoiding evil, but perfection. Doing everything without a mistake, without a sin. Seems impossible when we hear it on the surface. How would it be possible for a sinful, finite, fallible human being to be perfect? Well, without looking into the context of Jesus saying, probably many Christians have been tempted to give up their Christian walk because it seems too daunting to do everything perfect. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Matthew chapter 5. We'll start in verse 43. For those of you who are joining us, as guests or haven't been with us, we are going through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' main teaching as he's embarking on his ministry, telling his disciples how you can live a prosperous, happy, joyous life here on earth. So if we look in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, last week we looked at going the extra mile and forgiving our enemies and not taking revenge. Jesus continues in verse 43 of Matthew chapter 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. As Jesus said, this was a maxim that the Jews had heard. Love your neighbor. Hate your enemy. This is an age-old principle that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that if we hate our enemies, if we all have a common enemy, that really unites a group of people. And rulers and organizations have been doing this since Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And they were doing it at the time of Jesus. Love your neighbors but watch out for your enemies. Have that animosity, that hatred towards them because it's hard telling what they are going to do. And by the way, this does bring some unity to a group. Having a common enemy does unify a group of people. This is a timely message for us. We live while there are wars going on, and there's a war going on right now in Ukraine. But here in our country, did you know that hate groups are growing? And it is timely for us, as I just read in the Orlando Sentinel, that Florida has the second most amount of hate groups of any state in the nation. 68 of the over 1,000 are right here in our state. And it is easy, too easy for us to say, well, we're just polarized, and then get into our echo chambers with our other groups, and then we start spewing out bad things about the, the other group. Whether it's the way they think, whether it's the way they look, whether it's where they were born, it is all too easy to get together in our groups and gang up against another group. So this message isn't just for the Jews of Jesus' day. It's for his followers throughout all time. And he states it directly, if we just love those who love us, we are no better than the world. Tax collectors, pagans, people who don't even pretend to believe in a God do that kind of thing. It's easy to agree with those who agree with us and love those who love with us. But Jesus, Jesus knew that it is not easy to love those who are our enemies. 
And he said there would be no reward in heaven for those who just love those who love them. This is the context of the perfection that Jesus talks about. He's not talking about perfectly observing a Sabbath or having a perfect diet or doing everything just right or having a perfect devotional life. What he's talking about is actually much more difficult. It's actually having a change of heart and loving those who probably don't love us. This, he said, would make us quote unquote, perfect. Let's look at that Greek word. The Greek word is teleos for perfection. And it is used in Greek in a special way. It has nothing to do with an abstract, philosophical, metaphysical perfection. It is used for a man who has reached full grown adulthood and is teleos in comparison to a young boy who is still growing. It is used for a student who is entering, let's say, college and has a more mature knowledge of topics in comparison to a first grader who's just starting and learning how to read and write and, and, and just add num simple numbers together. Those people are teleos. They are perfect because they have grown in their understanding and their maturity. A victim for a sacrifice for God was called teleos and that it was set aside for that sacrifice. Listen to William Barclay as he describes this word teleos. The Greek idea of perfection, and I want you to note this, is functional. A thing is perfect if it fully realized the purpose for which it was planned and designed and made. In point of fact, that meaning is involved in the derivation of the word. Teleos is the adjective formed from the noun telos. Telos means an end, a purpose, or a goal. A thing is teleos if it realizes the purpose for which it was planned, and a man is perfect, quote-unquote, if he realizes the purpose for which he was created and sent into the world. So Jesus uses this Greek word teleos and he says you are perfect that is you are doing what you were designed for what you were created for and you are becoming like your father when you love your enemies. Now what kind of love is this? Because this doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound too appealing. The Greeks had four words for love. Storge was the first word. It was a warm word for family love. Brothers and sisters together, siblings towards their parents, parents towards their children. That was storge. Then there was eros, between a man and a woman, erotic love. Then there was philia, and philia was the warmest and the best Greek word for love. It was the closest of friends. It was the, the warmest of affections for the people that we're especially close to and that we shared life with, where we get the word Philadelphia, brotherly love. But then there was a fourth word, and that word was agape. And that agape means it's an unconquerable, unconquerable benevolence an invincible goodwill that we have for everyone. So let us make this very clear. This is, Jesus was not talking about taking our enemies and being buddy-buddy with them and slapping them on the back and inviting them over and, and having them be your best buddies. After all, they are your enemies, and sometimes it's, it's actually dangerous to be around them. But what Jesus was talking about was having an agape love for them, desiring the best. And notice, he even says that you can love some people from afar. Why? He says you can pray for those who are persecuting you. You can do that at home in your closet. You don't have to have your enemy right next to you to do that. And Jesus tells us, pray for those who persecute you, your enemies. It's probably fitting to tell the story of two Martin Luthers to illustrate this concept. 
The first Martin Luther, you remember, was the great Protestant reformer who set Europe ablaze with a love for studying the Bible after over 1,000 years of most of Christians not doing this. He was a giant amongst the reformers, and he was a giant in history, not just one of the most influential people in Christian history, but one of the most influential people in all of history. He changed the course of Europe. He changed the course specifically of Germany, and he really, in effect, changed the course of our country by starting the Protestant movement. He stood before the most powerful rulers of the world, declared his love for the Bible, his love for Jesus. He was risking his life. And he did a great work for God. However, even though Martin Luther did a wonderful work for theology in introducing the church once again to Bible study, he did not do a very good work in commenting on this passage about loving our enemies. I could not find anything on the internet, at least, that Martin Luther wrote about loving your enemies. His wife even told him once, Martha, Martin, you need to calm down and quit saying such bad things about those who disagree with you. And he said, I can't. I have, they, don't, they don't understand. I need to keep fighting against them. I'm going to read somewhat extensively from some of his quotes so that you get a feeling for what he was like, especially at the end of his life and end of his ministry. He was having many very strident arguments with Jewish rabbis at the time. And this is what he wrote about the Jews of his day. Moreover, they are nothing but thieves and robbers who daily eat no morsel and wear no thread of clothing which they have not stolen and pilfered from us by means of their accursed usury. And at that time, there were many Jews that had banks and he didn't like the amount of interest they were charging. Thus they live from day to day together with wife and child by theft and robbery as arch thieves and robbers in the most impenitent security. Then he said this, first we should set fire to their synagogues and schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever see again a stone or a cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, and blaspheming, blaspheming of his son and Christians. For whatever we tolerated in the past unknowingly, and I myself was unaware of it, will be pardoned by God. But if we, now that we are informed, were to protect and shield such a house for the Jews existing right before our very nose in which they lie about, blaspheme, curse, vilify, and defame Christ and us, it would be the same as if we were doing all this and even worse ourselves as we very well know. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed, for they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. Instead, they might be lodged under a roof or in a barn like the gypsies. This will bring home to them that they are not masters in our country, as they boast, but they are living in exile and in captivity as they incessantly wail and lament about us before God. End of quote. This attitude of hatred and encouraging revenge and acts of violence towards one's enemies stalled God's work we call the Reformation. Lutherans, instead of having a newfound love for their Catholic and Jewish quote-unquote enemies of their faith, were still zealous for getting revenge. Within 100 years of Luther's death, Germany would go on to fight in the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648, which would decimate Germany's agriculture, their economy, and even about half of their population. Luther's writings would, about 400 years later, be picked up by another German leader called Adolf Hitler and be used to help commit the greatest atrocity of the 20th century, the Holocaust. Luther wrote a lot about righteousness by faith. He translated the Bible into German, and he did a great work for God. But he did not go on to perfection. God was not able to continue to use the Protestant Lutheran movement, I believe, to a great degree, because they retained this worldly sense of vengeance 
and hatred for enemies. This lack of perfection will forever taint Martin Luther's legacy that he's left on the Christian church and on the world. But let's take a look at a second Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. It's the last Sabbath of Black History Month, and I thought it would only be fitting to bring forth one of the greatest black reformers, Martin Luther King Jr., to show how perfection can help the world and not hurt it. Martin Luther King Jr. was born into a black Baptist minister's family in Atlanta, Georgia in 1929 during the time of segregation. At the age of six, he is, his best friend was white. And when it was time to go to school, his white friend went to a white school, his black, and he went to a black school. And soon after this, the white family came to Martin and told him, our boy cannot play with you anymore because we are white and you are colored. It was at this time Martin's parents sat him down and told him about the history of slavery in this country and the history of racism. Upon learning this, Martin stated that he, and I quote, was determined in his soul to hate every white person. But his parents told him, no, it was his Christian duty <clears throat> to love everyone. Later, during his time at Crozier Theological, Theological Seminary, after he decided to follow in his father's footsteps and join the ministry, he fell in love with a white German immigrant's daughter who worked in the cafeteria. They wanted to get engaged. However, he was advised by his friends and family that it would not be wise to marry her and make an interracial family during that time, and it would impede his ministry. So he broke it off. One friend noted that he, quote unquote, never recovered. With all of this personal pain in the background, due to race relations, Martin decided to concentrate on Jesus' teachings, and specifically the passage that we study or are studying today. And it would lead him to be one of the greatest civil rights leaders the world has ever seen. I want to share somewhat extensively, so if you'll forgive me, I'll be reading this, some passages from his sermon that he preached on this exact passage in, in the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, in November of 1957, so before the Civil Rights Movement really gained a lot of traction. He starts saying this, Certainly, these great words, speaking of the passage we just read, these are words lifted to cosmic proportions. And over the centuries, many persons have argued that this is an extremely difficult command. Many would go so far as to say that it just isn't possible to move out into the actual practice of this glorious command. They would go on to say that this is just additional proof that Jesus was an impractical idealist who never quite came down to earth. So the arguments abound. But far from being an impractical idealist, Jesus has become the practical realist. The words of this text glitter in our eyes with a new urgency. Far from being the pious injunction of a utopian dreamer, this command is an absolute necessity for the survival of our civilization. Yes, it is love that will save our world and our civilization. Love, even for our enemies. Now let me hasten to say that Jesus was very serious when he gave this command, Luther continues. He wasn't playing. He realized that it's hard to love your enemies. He realized that it's difficult to love those persons who seek to defeat you, those persons who say evil things about you. He realized that it was painfully hard, pressingly hard, but he wasn't playing. And we cannot dismiss this passage as just another example of oriental hyperbole, just a sort of exaggeration to get over the point. This is a basic philosophy of all that we hear coming from the lips of our master because Jesus wasn't playing, he was serious. 
We have the Christian a moral responsibility to seek to discover the meaning of these words and to discover how we can live out this command and why we should live by this command. He goes on to show the underpinnings of the whole civil rights movement. And I, I, will, I want to continue on because he talks about three ways to deal with those who are enemies, those who are oppressing us. And he gives these three, three ways. The first one is, and he says, is to rise up against oppressors with physical violence and corroding hatred. But, oh, this isn't the way. For the danger and the weakness of this method is its futility. Violence creates many more social problems than it solves. And I've said in so many instances that as the Negro in particular and colored peoples all over the world struggle for freedom, if they succumb to the temptation of using violence in their struggle, unborn generations will be the recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness, and our chief legacy to the future will be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. Violence is not the way. Another way, he says, is to acquiesce and to give in. Resign yourself to the oppression. Some people do that. They discover the difficulties of the wilderness moving into the promised land, and they would rather go back to the despots of Egypt because it's difficult to get to the promised land. And so they resign themselves to the fate of oppression. They somehow acquiesce to this thing. But that too is not the way because non-cooperation with evil as, is as much a moral obligation as is cooperation with good. But, he adds, there is another way. And that is to organize mass, nonviolent resistance based on the principle of love. It seems to me that this is the only way as our eyes look to the future. As we look out across the years and across the generations, let us develop and move right here. We must discover the power of love. The power, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make this old world a new world. We will be able to make people better. Love is the only way. Later, he would add, not in this sermon, about driving out darkness. He said this, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. The story of two Martin Luthers, one who decided to hang on to corroding hatred, actually trying to inspire people to do acts of violence. His movement did not go on to perfection. Martin Luther King Jr. began his ministry, and he always said he was a pastor and would always remain a pastor in fighting for justice and equality for all. And he used this passage that we're studying today as the keystone, the basis, the underpinning for everything that he did. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Housing Rights Act of 1968 all were a direct result in our country to peaceful, loving protest where Martin Luther encouraged people of color and white people to love each other and fight for one another. Amen. This is the test of our Christianity. This is the apex of the Sermon on the Mount. If there's one passage that the Muslim world wants to hear about, all our Adventist missionaries overseas say, if you want to talk to Muslims about the Bible, talk about this passage. This is a passage that the world needs. We need. Because if we just love those who love us, and if we get in our echo chambers in society and don't associate with anybody else and start sending volleys over the board to the other side, we are no better than a pagan who says they have, want nothing to do with the God of heaven. But if we're followers of Jesus, and if you're questioning today, and you, and you want to know, is my Christianity real? Is, is my walk with Jesus real? 
ask yourself this one question. This is it. Do I love my enemies? Do I pray for those who persecute me and say bad things about me? Then you'll be able to tell. Are you walking with Jesus or are you not? Now, some of you might get discouraged. It is discouraging. And I believe Jesus gave this because he, he knew it's, it's really impossible for us. First John 4, 19 later said, the only reason we love is what? Because Jesus first loved us. I think of my friend who moved to the Middle East and she told me, she said, I got to this Middle Eastern country and I won't mention the country. I went out on the street and she said, I, I just, I heard the call to prayer early in the morning. If you've been in an Islamic country, you know the call to prayer usually comes about 4.45 or 5 in the morning. You hear this really loud. It's all over any city you're at. You wake up, you go outside, everybody's in hijabs, everything's different. She said, I, I hated it there and I hated the people there. And I'm a missionary. She said, I went in and prayed to the Lord and I begged God. I just told God, God, I don't like these people. Can you grant me a love for them? I can tell you now, she's one of the most active persons in our whole worldwide church for reaching Muslims, and she loves them to death. Why? Because she realized Jesus' teaching, that we are to love everybody. Can we do it? Can Democrats pray for Republicans and Republicans pray for Democrats? Can whites pray for blacks and blacks pray for whites? Can vaxxers pray for anti-vaxxers and anti-vaxxers for vaxxers? Can Ukrainians pray for Russians and Russians pray for Ukrainians? It's a test. We're going to come here Wednesday night. We're going to pray for Ukraine. But we're also going to pray for Vladimir Putin. Why? We're going to live out Jesus' teaching. That's what we're called to do as a community. It's hard. I don't feel like praying for Vladimir Putin right now. I'm sorry. It's not in my heart. But I just remember Jesus' words. That's what we we're supposed to do. So I ask you this morning, church, are you actually following Jesus' teaching? Are you loving your enemies, doing good unto those who despise you, praying for those who persecute you? Are you being perfect?